first case I'm talking about today, which is Kong v. United States, which is just the best name for what this case is. And I'm certainly not making fun of Mr. Kong's name. In fact, I am loving Mr. Kong's name <laughs> because he has the power of a King Kong with what he pulled out with the assistance of the ACLU in this case in the First Circuit last month. And Mr. Kong is from Cambodia. And I spent uh, spent about two months in Cambodia between undergrad and law school. So there's certainly a, a special place in my heart for Cambodia. Um, not that that has much to do with Mr. Kong, but I always like seeing a Cambodian case. You don't see him often. And you probably know about it, like with the Cambodian and Vietnamese individuals, a lot of them came um, during or just after as boat people, the, <clears throat> the war in Indochina. And you know, a lot of them, like Mr. Kong, came when they were really young, went through the school system, not making excuses, but, you know, a fair amount of them, probably the same as any group of people, really, but a fair amount of them got criminal records when they were young adults. They got removal orders, kind of like yeah. the Cubans. They didn't care because the U.S. wasn't deporting people to Cambodia and Vietnam in the 70s and the 80s. We didn't even have relations with those countries, but it all started to change under the Clinton administration. We started getting relations and there are these memos of agreements. It's it's still quite complicated, to be honest with you, I think, how America can deport Cambodian and Vietnamese people. But now, of course, these people like Mr. Kong are in their 50s. They're good people. They have families. Like, they did some stupid stuff when they were 21. And, like, they're like, oh, my God. And it seems like this is one of the first things that the Trump administration was trying to do as it was trying to pick up the low-hanging fruit um, and not build a wall but just to yeah. look like they were doing something powerful on immigration. They started rounding up Cambodians and Vietnamese people at the beginning of the Trump administration. A lot of it happening in New England. That's where a lot of these people live. Who had old outstanding removal orders. Mr. Kong appearing at his ICE appear, uh, appointments for years, like over 15 years, I want to say. And at the last one, they're like, all right, well, you got to sit for this interview. And so he sits for the interview. Like, everything is going fine. But what had happened is the United States had reached an agreement with Cambodia such that Cambodia would start accepting Cambodian people back with removal orders, but like none of them have travel documents, so they have to sit for an interview with Cambodian consulate and determine <laughs> are you Cambodian, all that stuff. No indication, Mr. Kong, and everything, everybody agrees Mr. Kong complied completely, they, but they didn't even tell him this was happening. He appears at his OSEP, they let him go, fine. And then like a week later or something on his way to work, literally on his way to work ice just picks him up like clothes on his back briefcase whatever he's got with him puts him in immigration prison didn't even tell him why for a week and the reason was to make sure that he sat for this interview with the cambodian uh official whatever he is yeah. but again mr kong never said well, i'm gonna do it he didn't even know about it they didn't even tell him they didn't even tell him that for a week i think he sits in detention for a couple of months you know, Mr. Kong, like all of these people, was released 15, 20 years prior because they couldn't deport him under Zadvidis and Damore and stuff. You know, you've got 90 days post removal order to release, to deport or release, essentially, so long as the non-citizen complies. And if you don't, you've got constitutional issues, a habeas petition can lie. So Mr. Kong was released a while ago. So why are they redetaining him? Right before it sounds seems like he was, I mean, it's a complicated case, but the facts are great. Right before he was about to get on a plane back to Cambodia, it appears he got his removal proceedings reopened, and they might have even been deportation proceedings pre Arira. And so they didn't have a final order anymore. So there's nothing to execute. So Mr. Kong, it looks like he's staying here. He probably married a U.S. citizen. Looks like Mr. Kong is probably going to be fine. I think he might have, who knows, whatever. That's mm -hmm. not what this case is about. This case is about him suing ICE. For wrongful detention, yeah. for wrongful arrest, um, Federal Tort Claims Act lawsuit for money against ICE, which that's what Mr. Kong, I mean, name, living up to the name, <laughs> Sue ICE, of course, with ACLU, New England's, I think it's ACLU, Massachusetts, is help. And the facts are very interesting. This case comes down to the statute INA section 242G which is one of the many jurisdictions stripping provisions of the INA, which says you can't sue ICE for a lot of the reasons. And one of those reasons is for, and I want to get the language perfectly right here so I can 
because the language is important. You can't sue ICE if for for decisions or actions relating arising from decisions or actions to execute removal orders. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when they detained him, there was no question that ICE was trying to execute the removal order. But is detaining you so you can sit for an interview with a Cambodian official, especially when you never refused to in the first place, is that tethered sufficiently to executing a removal order such that you can't sue ICE if they do something wrong? First Circuit said it's not. First Circuit said you can sue ICE. This isn't like detaining Mr. Kong to immediately remove him. That probably couldn't sue ICE. Maybe you could, probably can't. But this is different. There's that step. And they lost the benefit of the doubt when they released him after 90 days. So Mr. Kong can sue. That's what this case all comes down to. And if Mr. K Kong can sue, then you're off to the races to prove that ICE did something wrong, to depose ICE officers, to get into why they decided to detain him in the first place yeah. without telling him anything for a whole week when he's on his way to work. Continued detention is unconstitutional unless it serves certain aims. That's from the decision. And Mr. Kong has already been detained past the 90 days. So uh, he gets detained for 50 days on his way to work without getting... Wow. For no reason other than to have him sit for this interview that, it, by all accounts, he would have sat for anyway. He's not, a 55-year-old man is not going to flee, by all accounts. So Mr. Kong can sue. ACLU Massachusetts makes some good law for non-citizens in the First Circuit. Federal Tort Claims Act, it's really the only tool for money that people, ha that people have, non-citizen or not, against the federal government because the Supreme Court has, has killed Bivens. Bivens' actions don't exist anymore. The last term, the Supreme Court said that a literal CBP officer who did illegal things against a, albeit probably a smuggler in Washington state, but did illegal things against that person couldn't be sued under Bivens, even though everyone agrees they're completely illegal. Because yeah. it seems like the Supreme Court won't entertain a Bivens action unless it's the exact facts that happened in Bivens, which will never happen. So anyway, this isn't about Bivens. Bivens is out. The Federal Tort Claims Act is pretty much the only thing there. Government's always going to come at you 242A, 242G. And here's a good decision to say no. And it's another good decision to have in your back pockets. As you appear for your OSIPs with your terrified clients with their final orders of removal, who've been doing good things for all these years, especially if administrations change as they did and you don't know what's going to happen. At least there's something to hold ICE accountable. You can't just be detaining people necessarily because they have a final order of removal. So what happens now? I guess sent back to district court for them to do termination of fees and stuff. Well, not fees. I mean, so now they got to do the case. As with I so many fees, right? The district court dismisses for lack of subject matter jurisdiction under 242G. Now you got to have the whole case. Mm -hmm. But, you know, who knows what will happen? But like ACLU, they're not, they're going to fight the case. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of like us when, with the uh, with the fake university, the UNNJ case, the University of Northern New Jersey we represented a, a class action of non-citizens who were kind of entrapped in this fake ICE university that didn't exist, that had a fake president who was tweeting fake tweets about class, mm -hmm. <laughs> the University of Northern New Jersey. And we lost at the Third Circuit uh, in District Court, District of New Jersey, on jurisdictional grounds. And then we won by published decision at the Third Circuit, just on jurisdiction. And when it got sent back, all of a sudden, DOJ wanted to talk settlement. So, you know, do they really want to fight these cases if you can get around jurisdiction? Sometimes not, because sometimes things are a bit ugly when you start peeling back the onion. That position's in there, get some discovery in there, and see the insanity of how they operate. Uh, just yeah. Business, yeah. That's litigation, but, you know, it costs hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to do it. That's why the yeah. uh, only entities that can do it are things like the ACLU and the big firms that you team up with, because, you know, DOJ has got unlimited money. Um, if you can why get do you think that is so expensive. 
why is it so expensive? <laughs> yeah, I was a lawyer, so no, but <laughs> why is it like that expensive for a case like that? Just reading all the documents and stuff like that? Or... I mean, I can, how long does it take me to to defend a motion, just just the motion to dismiss? Uh, to draft a legitimate federal complaint takes, a, I don't know, five, 10 hours, who knows? Right, yeah. I did a motion to reopen, uh, I got approved uh, yes, last week. Now, basically, on a F1 chain of status was denied. It's really stupid. We did most reopen. It was fixed up, approved um, yeah. in about 60 days. But yeah, that took me like six hours to write it out, the facts, and organize it. And like, I was, I was right. like, yeah. To really get in there with the facts and to do a complaint, five, 10 more hours. And then the government's going to file a motion to dismiss, to defend a motion to dismiss, 15, 20 hours, and then discovery, 100 hours. Defending yeah. and filing a motion for summary judgment, a million hours. So, I mean, I think that's I think that's why. <laughs> when you mentioned Cambodia, I remember the Trump administration, they told a bunch of countries that we're not going to issue visas to your nationals anymore until you uh, take your, you know, removable, like, you know, app, whatever that the situation is. So I guess Cambodia caved and uh, said, OK, uh, we want to get visas, so we'll give in. Uh, yeah. There's a, like four or five different countries that said that, too. They did this with. Uh, but, I'm, uh, unclear. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit unclear what the situation is with Cambodia and Vietnam and taking back their their people. But, uh, you know, whatever. It's just yeah. another one of the wrinkles of immigration law. Yep. Yeah. Oh, interesting stuff. Well, that's good news. Uh, yeah. yeah, I kind of wanted to go to a trial because I want to get that, that the discovery, see what's going on behind. Peel the curtain. Yeah. But they'll probably yeah. stop. They'll probably give in much faster than to peel that curtain. I have a feeling Mr. Kong has good things ahead. We'll see. Yeah, get a, some money. Yeah, the American way. <laughs> Make money from lawsuits. <laughs>